Absolutely. Right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. My name is uh, Brett Griffin Young. I'm the uh, International Outreach Associate for uh, Circle Surrogacy, and I'm actually based in the UK. I'm um, based in Nottinghamshire, um, and I'm also a parent through the program. And this evening, I'm going to be taking you through the um, process side of surrogacy uh, and in exploring your surrogacy options here in the UK. Um, I will be traveling to London with John Weltman uh, next month to be holding face-to-face -face consultations, uh, which are available to uh, register for online at the moment. And um, I'm also available after this call at any point for any sort of follow-up Skype conversations if you just want a bit more information, or if you want to fire us an email, questions over to me, I'm happy to answer those as well. So yes, thank you very much for, for joining us this evening. Um, let's kick off then with um, the first slide, which is just Bear with me, it takes a few seconds to, some reason, there we go. So on tonight's panel uh, is myself, as I've introduced myself, Scott Buckley, uh, who's the Director of Operations and an attorney at Circus Surrogacy. We have Colin Rogerson, who's a solicitor um, at Dawson Cornwall in London, and we have Tara, who's a circle parent from the UK. Um, all th four of us will be talking this evening. And at the very end, we'll have the opportunity to ask any questions that you wish. During our conversations, though, please feel free to submit your questions, but we will only be answering those at the end of the um, webinar this evening. So a little bit of housekeeping. I think this slide speaks for itself. Uh, you can listen in by phone or if using your computer speakers. Uh, you are currently on mute, but you can use the question panel, as I just mentioned. And as I said, we'll give you an opportunity to enter your questions at the end. And we're recording this webinar, and we will email it to you as well. Um, so if you do drop the call for whatever reason, it will be a, a listen again later option. Right, what are we going to cover this evening? So first of all, part one, as I mentioned, this will be myself. We're going to be going through a little bit of the history of circle surrogacy and the background of the company. Um, we'll be looking at gestational surrogacy versus GSED, or gestational surrogacy with egg donation. Um, the process and programs that we offer. And in part two, which Scott will be covering, will be the insurance and the costs and the legal work. Part three will be the UK law, which uh, Colin will be covering off for us. And then a parent's perspective, which will be Tara towards the end. And then, of course, as I mentioned yet again, we'll be uh, answering all your questions. Also, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, coming up is some face-to-face -face consultations and a, an information session in uh, London. That is uh, Bank Holiday Weekend, the 1st and the 2nd of May, so the Sunday and the Monday. Um, we're offering the consultations on both of those days, and then the uh, information session, as I mentioned, is on the 1st of May. You can register for any, either of these events, or both if you wish, online at our website, or you can email me directly. And I'm sure when we email you the uh, webinar at the end of this, my email address will be in that email, so feel free to get in touch directly with me if you wish to meet with us in London. Right, let's start off then with the process and a bit of background on Circle surrogacy. So Circle is one of the oldest and largest surrogate parenting agencies in the world. Um, John Weltman, who's the president and founder, who will be traveling to London with me, is uh, recognized worldwide as an expert in reproductive law, which includes surrogacy and gay parenting. He speaks regularly on various panels around the world. Um, he began his surrogacy legal work in 1991, and he founded the agency in 1995. And he himself is a father through surrogacy to two boys, both of which are now at university. So I won't give John's age away, but he did do this quite some time ago. Right, so why circle surrogacy? Well, first of all, we've helped bring more than 1,100 babies into the world. And we've had nearly 100% success rate. And the only reason why it's been nearly 100% is because there are occasions when people uh, do not wish to use an egg donor and leave the program without a baby. But we have a, a philosophy at Circle that if you stick with us, we, we guarantee you a baby at the end of the process. Um, we have an unlimited IVF program. We have unlimited matching with surrogates and egg donors. It's part of the fixed fee program, which I think Scott will touch on in his section. Uh, we've got a tremendous amount of international expert expertise. We've worked in many, many countries now, and, and, and the list of countries continues to grow. I'm, I'm quite astonished as the international person um, how many more interested intended parents there are coming from um, slightly more unusual 
unexpected countries. Um, and I think that is mostly because Circle is recognized as an international agency with a lot of expertise around the world. We have intended parents from all backgrounds. Uh, we have the SPA program for HIV positive intended parents. We also have a big emphasis on known egg donation. And, and often as a European, and particularly as a British intended parent, when you speak of uh, known egg donation, people will be a little concerned around the, the um, what that would mean for them moving forward and so on. And, and this is something that we would cover off in the consultation, or certainly in a, in a, a start consultation, a conversation with myself, where I would give you a bit of an idea as to why it's actually an exceptionally good thing to have. Um, we're a relationship-based agency. You're expected to have a relationship with your surrogate. That, you know, you will inadvertently become friends with your surrogate. Um, they're going to do the most amazing thing for you and change your life forever. And they're not a, uh, a uterus with legs. They are human beings. They're amazing human beings who are going to help you do the most amazing thing ever. Um, support throughout the process from the very, very beginning right through to the birth and beyond. My child has, is six and a quarter now. And just last year, Circle were assisting us with doing some final legal work for him. So five and a half years post-delivery, Circle are still in our lives helping us out with our child. Um, and the other thing that Circle is exceptionally good at is the long-term planning. The reason why you don't hear of the horror stories when using Circle surrogacy around the children being stranded or surrogates um, changing their minds and that sort of stuff is simply because of the long-term planning. We take everything into consideration at the beginning to make sure that the process is as smooth as possible and as legally sound as possible so that there's no issues at the end, which is the really important part where you're trying to bring the baby back to the United Kingdom. Uh, three components of a surrogacy journey. First of all, communication, um, and that is communication with your, uh, your, your uh, agency, your IVF clinic, your surrogate, your egg donor, and certainly with each other if you're in a partnership. Um, trust, you have to have a lot of trust. I always speak to intended parents in my consultations around the, the leap of faith that is required to start a, sur a, a surrogacy journey, and that you you, you have to trust a lot of people involved in this process. You have to trust your surrogate. You have to trust your agency. You have to trust your IVF clinic. You have to trust your egg donor. Um, and letting go of control in, in, in such a way that you understand that actually somebody else is going to take control for you here. That doesn't mean that you have no control of the process. It just means that there are many aspects of the journey where you will not have control and you need to let go of that control. But this, again, is something that I would talk in more detail around um, in, in a consultation setting and, and into certainly more detail around that. Right, I mentioned gestational surrogacy versus gestational surrogacy with egg donation. I think it's pretty self-explanatory in the title, but with gestational surrogate, you would be providing all of the needed biological material to create the embryo, so you would have um, an egg donor that you, 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 already, you have chosen yourself independently, or, or at least you, you're a heterosexual couple who are using um, your own biology and all you need is the assistance of a gestational surrogate. Um, and we would match you with a gestational surrogate that meets your legal, your psychological, and your emotional needs. So it's not just a legal um, thing that we look at when it comes to matching. We look at what makes you tick. What are you looking for in a surrogate? What is important to you? And we match as best as possible on those sorts of levels as well. Uh, gestational surrogacy with egg donation, again, pretty self-explanatory. You're selecting an egg donor from our network of egg donor agencies and clinics, and we then match you with a gestational surrogate that obviously, again, meets your legal, psychological, and your emotional needs. Right, the surrogacy process, um, and this is a very brief overview. Obviously, as I said in the consultation, I, you know, I've got an hour and a half or so to go through a lot more information with you. but. It would start with the consultation. Uh, from there, you would move on to being officially welcomed into the, uh, into the program. Um, the program coordination team kicks in, and you are assigned a coordinator who's going to be your main point of contact through the whole process. Um, your intended parent support team is available to you. Your clinic choice is something that you would need to, to choose. We, we have relationships with a couple of clinics in the United States. Um, especially for our international intended parents where you're unfamiliar with IVF processes in the US. 
um, or who is a good clinic to work with, who isn't, and so on. We have these great relationships with these clinics where we can introduce you, and it is a seamless introduction. Um, but you would make the, the ultimate final choice as to which one you wanted to work with. Uh, you'd be looking at your egg donor selection, if that is obviously needed, if, you need a, a, if you're doing GSED. Um, and again, this is something that you will receive a lot of help and support with in ensuring that we're presenting you with profiles that um, match your requirements. And then it comes down to the surrogate matching, as we mentioned earlier, the matching on the legal front, the psychological, emotionally. And then journey coordination through the whole process um, and, and beyond, as, as I'm an example of. But, so the program coordination, a little bit more information on this then. So it starts with a welcome, really. So you'd be introduced to your, um, your program coordinator who is going to be working with the intended parents. Your coordinator is also going to work with the gestational surrogate and with a donor when necessary. So your coordinator sort of is the go-between between three very important working parts. Um, they're also going to be connecting you with the various parties, so insurance, uh, clinic, the legal department, etc. And that would be, you know, legal as in your surrogate's local council as well as the legal department in circle and so on. Uh, they also are responsible and help with the travel for the gestational surrogate and the donor, which will be from their home, wherever that might be, to your chosen clinic. Um, and obviously the payments to the gestational surrogate and to the donor. And then they're very heavily involved with the hospital preparation, which is done around about seven months pregnant towards the end of the pregnancy. Right, let's talk a little bit about the surrogates. So this is actually Jamie, one of our surrogates. Um, and this is one of the main reasons why my husband and I chose to work with Circle back in 2008 when we signed up. It was to do with the surrogates. There's an exceptionally high standard when it comes to being a surrogate for Circle. We only accept roughly between 1% to 2% of applicants who apply to be surrogates for Circle surrogacy. Um, one of our main criteria is that we're looking for women who want to help others, that their main motivation is they actually want to help somebody else have a child. Um, some of the highlighted requirements, and there are many, and, and I, I will probably say this several times through my part in this webinar, that um, during the consultation I would go through a lot more detail on this, but some of the highlighted requirements, they have to have a healthy BMI within the clinic's guidelines. They must be aged between 21 and 41 years of age. They have to have given birth to at least one healthy child. Um, there's full psychological screening. There's medical approval. Um, a couple of obvious ones. They have to live in a surrogate-friendly state within the United States. Uh, Scott will go into a little bit more detail around the legal um, requirements in the states. They have to have support of their family and friends. I mean, this is vitally important for them. Um, and then really obvious stuff like they don't use illegal drugs or tobacco or nicotine products of any sort or abuse alcohol. Egg donors, let's talk briefly about the egg donors. So this is one of our egg donors as well, this is actually Felicia. Um, right, so our egg donors, here are some of their highlighted requirements. They have to be aged between 20 and 29 years. Uh, they have to have a BMI of no higher than 28 to 30. They have to have a healthy family history, and that goes back to grandparents. So we will have that information. Um, no illegal drugs, again, obviously, or tobacco, nicotine products, or any alcohol abuse, and they have to have a minimum of high school degree. So this slide is a screenshot of our um, egg donor database and how you can go about searching for a donor. Um, again, this is something I think as Europeans we start feeling a little bit a little un unnerved by slightly, where we have to start being really specific about height and age and so on. Um, but really it is a process and, and, and it is your decision at the end of the day and, and it is very, very important that you choose the right egg donor for you. Um, so you are able to search, you're able to compare your donors and you can save favorites so you can go back and view those as well. Um, we also obviously have the egg donor team who are going to be helping you with, with, with all of this and you will receive a lot of information on each donor. Um, and you'll have a very, very informed decision to make. Um, you, you can run by any questions you want past the egg donor team. They will know these egg donors and they will be able to get answers for you as well. Okay, matching and types of egg donation. So I mentioned earlier that we are a uh, relationship-based agency, but also that we have a uh, 
known donor database. So there really are three types of egg donation. First one, known donation, which I've spoken about, and, and this is, I think, where we certainly stand out from other agencies in that we, we're, we have the ability to offer known egg donation, which is pretty much with all of our egg donors. So in a known egg donation situation, the intended parents can meet and exchange contact information with their donors. Um, it's something that my husband and I did, um, and we maintain contact with our donor. Semi-known donation, um, egg donors and intended parents can exchange demographic information um, and have the option to contact via Skype or telephone or at a fertility clinic. However, there's no exchange of any really personal details, last names or home address or anything like that. And then, obviously, anonymous donation, which kind of speaks for itself. It just involves no contact between the donor and the intended parents whatsoever. Um, and you really just have first names of the egg donor, and that's pretty much it. And, and their background information, obviously. Um, right. So, oh, this is my story. So here is uh, my lovely family, my beautiful children. I'm not going to go into too much detail of my lovely family because we have Tara on the phone, and she has an amazingly lovely family too. Um, and I would hate to steal any of her time or thunder. So um, very brief overview is my son, Sebastian, and my daughter, Georgiana. Um, my son, Sebastian, was born on New Year's Eve 2009 in Denver, Colorado. And my daughter, Georgiana, we actually adopted when she was eight months old here in the UK. So I've done both adoption and surrogacy. And again, this is something I'm happy to talk you talk to you about during a consultation or a Skype chat. Um, sort of my, my whole story, really, and, and how we came to have my family the way it is. Um, so there you go. That's my lovely husband, Matthew, in the blue jumper there, um, the beardless one. He now has a beard and my two beautiful children. And that, I think, is pretty much me done. And I'm very impressed I've managed to get through this without having a coughing fit. One of the delights you will discover when you have a family is that your children bring home every virus and bug in the known universe. Um, and I feel perpetually under the weather. <laughs> um, so on that note, I shall hand back to, am I coming back to you, Brian, or are we going directly to Scott? You're going to Scott now. <coughs> Okay. Hello, everyone. So, uh, as Brett mentioned before, my name is Scott Buckley. I'm an attorney at Circle. I'm the director of operations. I've worked here about 13 to 14 years now, and I'm one of the people that does consultations as well. Uh, I am, I will be in London, I believe, in September, but John's doing this next trip. So, my goal today is to talk and give you a little bit of an overview about insurance, legal, and the cost of surrogacy. Um, in the consultations, we would go into this in much greater detail, probably an hour, an hour and a half. Um, today, you get 10 to 15 minutes. The And I, I know a few people are writing in some questions. That's great. Um, we will answer all the questions, but we'll answer them all at the end. So the first thing I want to talk about is insurance. And when we speak about insurance, what we really want to do is limit your liability for medical expenses in the United States. And outside of the IVF expenses, the main expenses that you will run into are maternity expenses for the surrogate herself, and then the medical expenses for the child or the children born in the United States. <laughs> when we talk about maternity insurance, the short version is every surrogate in the United States will have her own insurance which would be billed for the medical expenses of her, her maternity care and the delivery of the child. Sometimes it happens that the surrogate, when she applies, already has her own insurance that one of the eight attorneys at Circle will review to make sure that it has maternity coverage and there's no exclusions for surrogacy. Um, if she doesn't have an appropriate insurance policy already, we will help ensure that she gets that policy. Um, there's a lot of detail about how to do that and the expenses related to that that we go into in a consultation. But for a, an overview, just understand that we will ensure that she has an, an insurance plan in place that we, we would charge for all of the maternity expenses. Now, the cost for the child or the children born in the United States is much different. For a single child, the chances of there being complications is very small probably 1% of the time or less, there are major complications. A single child usually costs two to $3,000 in the hospital, and they're released in a day or two. Twins are very different. With twins, there is a high risk that there could be problems. Twins on average are born about one month early. Half of them end up in an intensive care unit, 
and the average medical bill there is almost 100,000 US dollars. So we decide on how to handle the legal work and the insurance based upon not just what the surrogate has for insurance, but also what you need and what the risks are. With a single child, since there is a low cost, a low chance of there being high medical bills, many intended parents opt for what we call the fast match program, where we can match you with a surrogate in about one to four months. And with the fast match program, you do not have insurance in place to cover the child. And the goal would be that you would use your own insurance to cover the child if you have it, or most likely for international clients, you don't have insurance. And so you would just pay the cost of that two to $3,000 medical bill yourself. If it happened that you were in the fast match program and there was a huge complication, there are insurance plans that we can get in place after the birth that should be able to cover the medical bills. But since it's, since it's related to the Obamacare policies and there's a presidential election coming up soon, um, I would not want you to rely on that if you knew for sure you were going to try for twins because the risks are just too great. So basically with a single child, the goal is that you pay the medical bills unless there happens to be a very unusual circumstance. With twins, as I've already mentioned, the risks are much higher. So the short version here is if you are trying to have twins and if you're trying to put more than one embryo in, we assume that you're trying to have twins. If you're trying to have twins, it's important to have insurance in place from the very beginning that would cover the child or the children born in the, in the United States. So with a standard match program, we would match you with a surrogate that has her own insurance that not only should cover her own medical expenses, but also should cover the cost of the children born in the United States while they're in the hospital. Now, everybody would say, well, why not try for the standard match? The problem with the standard match is you're going to be limited in the states that you can work in and there and it's going to be much more limited in the number of surrogates that have that insurance. So the waiting period is much longer. It's typically about five to eight months to match with a surrogate with their own insurance to cover the children and the legal work will be delayed, take longer and you'll be in the United States a longer period of time. So generally, if you're trying to have one child, I would encourage you to consider the fast match program. If you're trying to have twins, you should really wait for the standard match program. <clears throat> we already mentioned a little bit, or I already mentioned a little bit about the risks and the costs um, about the actual children, but there are also risks of using the surrogate's insurance itself. Insurance companies occasionally try to deny coverage. One of the reasons that international clients often work with circle surrogacy is because we do have eight lawyers here and we stand by the intended parents throughout the process. That includes dealing with insurance companies. So part of our fees include fighting with the insurance company if there are any issues. Now, it's not very often that this occurs, but when it does occur, part of our fees include fighting the insurance companies, working with employers, working with medical providers to deal with the medical bills. In general, the cost of insurance will be about $15,000. And that breaks down into a number of different categories. There is a cost to get insurance in place. If the surrogate has her own insurance plan to begin, she will ask for a higher fee. So part of that $15,000 is a fee to her. If she does not have insurance already, that that money will go towards purchasing on a monthly on a monthly basis an insurance plan that should be used. There are also costs for the patient responsibility. In the United States, almost all insurance plans have a portion that has to be paid by the patient. Um, it could be a deductible or an excess that you must that you must pay before there's any coverage. It could be a co-insurance, meaning that you may have to pay 10% or 20% of the bills up to a certain point. But there is a portion that you would need to pay. Five years ago, these were minimal amounts, $500, maybe $1,000. Today, it's a much more significant amount, often three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000, which is why we factor that in on our cost sheet. <clears throat> there are also insurances in place for complications from an egg retrieval or transfers to an egg donor. There's a life insurance plan in place. 
We also work with a company called NES Assurance. And what they do is they have registered nurses that review every single medical bill to make sure that what you are being charged is proper. They will build a portal that you and your surrogate can sign into so you can see all the medical bills and have the transparency of knowing exactly what's being charged. And if you ever need local monitoring for your donor or for your surrogate, um, which means monitoring at a clinic other than your IVF clinic, because it may be a lot more convenient to your surrogate and cheaper than having her go to the clinic for an extended period of time, well, they will help find local monitoring clinics and negotiate discounts up front. So all of that is included in the $15,000 estimate for insurance. <clears throat> now moving on to the legal aspects. <clears throat> when we think about legal, there are three different categories you need to discuss. One are the contracts in place between you and the surrogate and you and the, uh, you and the donor if you need a donor. Second are establishing your parental rights, both in the United States and back home. And finally, talking about how exactly you do get home. <clears throat> so speaking first about the contracts, it's important to understand that Circle represents the intended parents. While we will help you find a carrier, while we can help you find a donor if you need, we always represent the legal interest of the intended parents, not those other women. <clears throat> carriers and donors will have their own, carriers and donors will have their own independent counsel. It's very important that both sides are represented by counsel when you're going into the contract. And really the point of the contract is not to win the deal. We're not trying to hide things from each other. The point of the contract is to make sure that everybody understands if this occurs, then this is the consequence. So we want, to, we want the carrier's attorneys, the donor's attorneys, to very carefully explain the contract so that they understand exactly what's going on. <clears throat> Finally, because we understand for international intended parents, and, and I don't know if I can't remember if Brett mentioned this, but about two-thirds of our clients are from other countries. We understand that you often have to do different things in different countries. So in the contract, we will be very clear about what is expected of them, and we will make sure that the carriers and the donors sign in, in the contract an agreement to help you in whatever way is necessary to establish your parental rights, not just in the United States, but back at home. <clears throat> to establish those parental rights, again, it really depends upon where you're where you guys live. So in the United States, we have many options about how you do the legal work. We can do what's called a pre-birth order. And before the baby's even born, you go to court, you put both of your names on the initial birth certificate, and the initial birth certificate then is all that you need because it has your names on it. You could also do that legal work after the baby's born. You could return home with the carrier's name on the birth certificate and the intended father's name. There's a lot of different options in the United States, and it really depends upon what you need so that we will match you in a state with a surrogate where we can do the legal work that is necessary for you at home. <clears throat> Before any surrogate match is presented to you, we will have already had an attorney review the legal work that is necessary, and we will have spoken to an attorney in your country, such as Colin, who, you're, who you'll speak to, um, about exactly what is necessary. For international intended parents, you really do need to consult with that attorney yourself as well so that you understand what is necessary when you go home. Um, for the UK, in many countries, we do the legal work in the United States and then you return home. In the UK, it's very different. The nice thing about the UK is even if they do not allow commercial surrogacy themselves, they have a, an established safe process by which you can return home get a parental order and establish your own rights to the children there. I'm not gonna speak about how to do that because Colin's on this call today, but you can speak with him or another a solicitor later on. The one thing I do wanna mention from Brett's comments, he mentioned that it took five and a half years for him. Legal work has changed. It will not take you that long. You'll do the legal work typically between six weeks and six months after the birth of the child back at home. Um, and finally, insurance will actually play a factor into how we do the legal work. Because I mentioned with the standard match program, if you're using the surrogate's rights 
or the surrogate's insurance to cover the children, then you cannot terminate her rights before the babies are born. So in that instance, you would always need to make sure that the surrogate still has rights to the children while the children are in the hospital and you're using her insurance. Only after they leave would you ever be able to, to terminate her rights. And again, that's probably not what you'll do from the UK perspective anyways. <clears throat> Citizenship and returning home. The other issue to think about is not just how you establish rights in the U.S. or the contracts, but also what will be the citizenship of the children going forward and how do you get home? Every child born in the United States is entitled, entitled to U.S. citizenship. Every child is entitled to a U.S. passport. From the U.S. perspective, you are allowed dual citizenship, and I, I know from the U.K. perspective that's allowed as well. In terms of the passport, many countries, the recommendation is to get a U.S. passport to return home. Again, I do not believe that's, that's typically not the way that things happen in the UK. A lot of it may depend upon whether the carrier is single or married, um, what citizenships you ultimately want for the child, and Colin will speak a lot about that as well. Um, we will help you on the US side. So if you need a US passport, we have a passport expediter that can get that in place within a day or two after you have the birth certificate. Um, and foreign counsel will help you if you need to get a visa or a passport from your own home country. And then you should also speak to the attorney about registering the child at home for all of the rights that come with your citizenship and living in the UK. So the next section is about the cost, which is what many people are concerned about. The reality is there is a lot of good and bad about surrogacy. The big, the main negative about surrogacy in the United States is the cost. Compared to any other country, surrogacy in the United States is more expensive. The, the positive of surrogacy in the United States is that you have a lot of control over the process. It's a very safe, established, secure process. We have never had a surrogate try to keep a child. We've never had an egg donor assert rights. We've never been unable to establish the parental rights of our intended parents. We've never had intended parents not be able to get home. So when you research on the internet surrogacy, oftentimes people find these cases in states where they should not have been matched or um, in foreign countries that scare them. In the United States, it is safe and secure, and, and secure, but you need to work with people that understand what they're doing. There is nothing that we as Circle need to do to call ourselves a surrogate parenting agency. There is no registration that is required. Anybody can consider themselves an agency. At Circle, we have eight lawyers. We have eight or nine social workers. We have accountants. Many other agencies do not have that. So when you're thinking about the cost of surrogacy, make sure that you do understand exactly what you're getting for what you're paying. When we think about the cost, I would say they break down into four categories of expenses. You have agency fees, carrier and donor fees and expenses, IVF charges, and insurance costs. <clears throat> Regarding the agency, Circle is a full service agency with accountants, social workers, and, account and, and attorneys. Circle is all inclusive. Our philosophy is that we want to help you get pregnant and we want to stay with you until you are, until you really have a child, even if there's a miscarriage. So our pricing is all inclusive. What that means is if you later need additional transfers, you don't pay us more. If you ever need a new surrogate or a new donor, you don't pay us more for matching with them. You don't pay us more for facilitating the transfer, the retrieval, for doing the legal work. Even the lawyers that represent the carriers and the donors, the psychologists that do the screening, all of their services are included in the pricing that you pay us up front. <clears throat> Carrier and donor fees are not typically the same as they are agency fees. In our general program, you will have a base fee for the carrier and the donor. There will be limits and caps on expenses, but generally the cost will vary depending upon how your journey goes. How quickly do you get pregnant? Are there any complications? Do you decide to have twins? If there are complications, if there are additional transfers that are needed, those all will incur additional expenses for travel or for payments to the carrier. Just like with twins, 
you will pay about $5,000 more to the carrier for carrying twins, and there's a much higher chance of bed rest and a C-section occurring. Now, Circle does offer a fixed fee program. So if you do have any, if you are concerned about the cost, you can pay Circle a higher fee up front, and we will take that risk on. The general idea of the fixed fee program is that we understand that we're going to have 200, 250 intended parents in a year. And if we want to spread that, the risk out over 200 people, as opposed to each individual intended parent, parent taking the risk on, we can do that. So in the consultation, we'd be more than happy to talk about the fixed fee program. Essentially, we collect about $10,000 more than we collect in the general program. And then Circle takes on the risk of additional fees paid to carriers or donors and additional travel expenses. The third expense of surrogacy is the IVF cost. Um, intended parents may work with any IVF clinic that you want. Um, some intended parents in the, in the United States in particular already have clinics. Oftentimes you need recommendations. We work with a number of clinics in the United States and we are happy to recommend whatever we think is appropriate for you. Generally the cost to create embryos and do your first transfer including medications and screenings, is around $25,000. Some IVF clinics will offer package deals where you can pay up front a higher fee, and then you have included within that package multiple transfers, multiple retrievals, or even completely unlimited IVF. One of the clinics that we work with offers completely unlimited IVF if you are using a donor for a little more than $37,000. If you want to do PGS testing, which is pre-genetic screening, where you test the quality of the embryos, that will be about $6,000 extra at any IVF clinic. And the last thing to comment on IVF, if you have embryos abroad, you need to speak with a US doctor about them. Many people want to save costs by creating embryos abroad. That is really not you should never do that without consulting U.S. doctors. To use an embryo in the United States, you need to comply with the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Generally, F according to the FDA, certain tests need to be done, and, they, and the IVF work needs to be done in an FDA-certified and approved clinic. There are exceptions to that rule. The general, the main exception to that rule is if you created embryos for your own use abroad, not using an egg donor, if you created embryos for your own use, then you often can use those embryos in the United States. However, even when that occurs, oftentimes the testing is very different and the protocols are different. I know many intended parents who have created embryos that were frozen at day one or day two or day three, when in the United States they, they freeze them at day five and they have very different success rates. So if you have frozen embryos or you ever wanted to create embryos for your own use that you may later use for surrogacy, you should speak with us about connecting you to an IVF doctor from the very beginning. Finally, with regard to, regard to cost, insurance, we already mentioned a lot about insurance. Generally, it's about $15,000, $16,000. And if you are fast match, you would have to pay the bills for the child and you'd expect a couple thousand dollars there. In total, the cost for at Circle. We will always collect all the fees for us, for the carrier, for the donor, and for insurance. So for, if you only need a surrogate, you're gonna probably expect about 100 to $105,000 for the cost of this. For surrogacy with an egg donor, it's going to be closer to about 125,000. Now again, with the fixed fee program, you would add on to that. The standard match is about 5,000 more. IVF is not included in these estimates. You certainly can pay that to us. Some of the clinics that we work with, that's a general practice. Um, many people that are making the payments from overseas feel comfortable sending it to um, the Weltman Law Group, which is the law firm we have here, as opposed to having a paper trail to a surrogate parenting agency. So we're always happy to do that, but those costs are not estimated in the general cost here because it varies based on the clinic. Finally, we go into much more detail in consultations. They are free, whether you do it on Skype, whether you do it in person when we're there. Um, it's typically about two and a half to three hours, and we go over exactly what Brett spoke about and what I spoke about in much more detail. 
it, it's already been mentioned, the next time that we are, will be in the UK, are in, we'll be in London at the beginning of May. So if you're interested, reach out to Brett and schedule that, and we'd love to speak with you. Okay, I'm going to give it to Brian to introduce Colin. Okay, Colin, are you there? Yeah, cool. I'm here. Let me just give you control. Okay, you should be all set. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Colin Rogerson, and I'm a solicitor advocate at Dawson Cornwall. Uh, so I specialize in um, family law, but a lot of my practice relates to fertility law and um, surrogacy and art work in England and Wales. Uh, and I practice in Dawson Cornwall, which is a niche family law firm based in London. And I work together with Anne-Marie Hutchinson, OBE, and now Honorary QC. Um, so there are a number of legal issues to consider from um, a UK perspective um, when you're um, thinking about entering into a surrogacy arrangement, um, and uh, in particular in international uh, surrogacy arrangements, the first thing you need to think about is, can I get a passport for my child in addition to the American passport, which will allow my child to live lawfully in, in the UK? Um, will my child need a visa? Um, Wills and estate planning, some of you may have may have wills already. Um, most agencies, including Circle, will require you to have wills in place to deal with things if things go wrong uh, and to appoint testamentary guardians. Um, are you a legal parent? That's an important question uh, and one that's becoming more and more important as cases are coming through where people haven't um, sorted out their legal parentage because of um, not getting a parental order and there are big issues and how do you secure those rights for your child. Um, I'll talk about the nationality and immigration issues first. Now, typical lawyer disclaimer here, I'm not an immigration lawyer, but I do know about the um, nationality issues that arise in surrogacy, although I'm not um, necessarily an expert on the um, timescales and things like that, but we do have a close working relationship with another firm who I know Circle also work with um, called Wesley Grick in London. Um, the first thing is that different countries have different laws about um, who they consider to be a citizen of their country. Uh, as um, Scott's already said, um, children who are born in the US are entitled to US passports, um, but the position in other countries is different. Um, and then whether the child is entitled to a British passport on birth depends on the marital status of the surrogate and the status of the commissioning parents. It's a good idea to contact an immigration lawyer before you sign the surrogacy agreement. Uh, it's certainly advisable to work out how you're going to bring the baby home um, before the child is born. And as I said, we work with a specialist nationality lawyer who has a great deal of experience in these cases. Um, wills and estate planning. Um, as I said, reputable surrogacy agencies will require provision to be made in wills to ensure that all parties are protected in the unlikely event of a death during the surrogacy process. Existing wills will need to be updated, and um, you'll need to appoint testamentary guardianship to ensure that if something were to happen to you during the child's minority, um, you're able to A, appoint guardians to look after your child, and B, to make sure that um, the surrogate's not left with the baby. Legal parentage in the UK. Now, this is my area of specialism. And the law in the UK will not recognize any form of parentage orders that are obtained in the home country. In the case of the US, um, you often have a pre-birth order, or depending on the circumstances, possibly post-birth orders, establishing your legal parentage in the state where your child is born. That will often result in there being a US birth certificate um, with and potentially both of you as the intended parents, as the legal parents on that birth certificate. That birth certificate is not recognized for the purposes of UK law. And um, under UK law, um, the child's mother is the woman who carried the child during pregnancy. So that's always going to be the surrogate. An egg donor is not going to be a legal mother under UK law. And also, if you have a full gestational surrogacy agreement without an egg donor, uh, where the in 
intended mother is the biological mother um, at the moment of birth under UK law she will not be a legal mother of that child uh, if the surrogate is married or in a civil partnership then her spouse or civil partner in most cases will be the second legal parent and if the surrogate is unmarried and not in a civil partnership then the intended father and with the biological link can be the legal father so that is important before I go on to the next slide that is important in the context of um, nationality and citizenship and that's where the difference between working with an unmarried carrier and a married carrier comes in an unmarried carrier if the intended father who provides the sperm is British and is able to pass on his citizenship to a child the child would automatically be British if the child if if the surrogate is married, presumably she's not going to be married to a British citizen, um, then the child will not have an automatic right to British citizenship from birth. And there'll have to be different processes to go to, either to get a passport for your child, British passport by registering the child as a British citizen overseas, or by getting a visa in the US passport, um, preferably before coming into the country. Uh, the border agency guidance and home office guidance is against traveling on the US passport um, without any entry clearance and asking for clearance at the border. Um, it's technically an immigration offense, although what often happens is that a visa is given for six months. Um, when a parental order is made at the end of that process, provided that you as the intended parents would be able to pass on citizenship to your child, um, or naturally your child will automatically become a British citizen so if you don't regularize your child's immigration status before you get a parental order the parental order will um, resolve that for you so what is a parental order well a parental order are oh, well, they, they are the bespoke orders for parents of children born through surrogacy they vest legal parentage of the child in the commissioning parents and remove the legal parentage of the surrogate mother um, Parental orders um, are provided for by the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, um, so it's a statutory order. And the Section 54 of that application, uh, sorry, of that Act, um, sets out a number of factors, a checklist that applicants of parental orders need to satisfy in order to um, get um, a parental order. The first thing is that they're only available in surrogacy arrangements. There must be a genetic link between at least one of the commissioning parents and the child. So if this is a um, case of donor sperm and donor egg, um, there, could, there would be problems in getting a parental order in the UK and we'd need to look at other ways um, to establish your parental rights. They are currently only available to couples. Um, but they are available to same-sex couples and unmarried couples. Um, and um, to couples in civil partnerships and same-sex couples uh, and unmarried couples have been able to apply for parental orders since April 2010. Um, the, both parents must be over the age of 18 and the application for a parental order must be made within six months of the child's birth. Having said that, um, there have recently been cases where the courts have um, granted orders um, where um, children have been significantly older when um, than six months but when they made the application um, it's still advisable though to, to make the application within the first six months of the child's birth and uh, we've seen I think um, Anne-Marie and I have dealt with about three cases since um, the case law changed to allow parental orders to be made out of time um, the child's home must be with the commissioning parents at the time of making the application and making the parental order and there is a requirement that at least one of you as the intended parents are domiciled in the United Kingdom, the Channel Islands or Isle of Man. Now domicile is um, can be quite a confusing concept um, particularly um, if any of you come from the continent uh, and are living in the UK it is more than just residence so a person who is born in the UK to British parents um, will have a domicile of origin in the UK either in Scotland or in England or Wales. The, um, you can change your domicile 
by taking up um, residence in another country and having an intention to permanently remain there. Uh, one of the tests is that you, where do you intend to live out the rest of your days. Um, if you are British and living overseas as expats, or if you are not British, or neither of you are British, but are living in the UK, and by British I mean born in the UK, um, because your domicile may be different even if you acquired nationality, you do really need to take advice from a local lawyer um, as to your state because that would impact on the matching process and the which which kind of surrogate you would be matched with. If you are not domiciled in the UK and you, you are living here and you want to establish some form of parental rights, this is much easier if you work with an unmarried carrier. Um, and in fact, in those cases, I would certainly advise only to work with an unmarried carrier. I would not advise working with a married carrier if you are not going to be domiciled in the UK. But the case law does suggest that the courts um, are relatively easily swayed on domicile. Um, and certainly we have managed to um, establish domicile in some cases where um, the case law previously might have suggested that um, they would not be considered domiciled in the UK. Um, the next point is that the parental order is a consensual application. The order can only be made if you're surrogate and if she's married her husband, wife or civil partner um, unconditionally agrees to the making of the order. And that consent cannot be validly given uh, for English law purposes until the child is at least six weeks old. Now that doesn't mean that your, ch your surrogate has to care for the child for um, six weeks as some people think. Um, but it, it just means that they can't formally give their agreement until the child's six weeks old. The main issue that, um, or not really an issue, but the main area where the court in England will um, concentrate its investigations, particularly in the context of an American surrogacy arrangement, is the issue of commerciality or compensation. The, it's often said that commercial surrogacy is illegal in the UK. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the full detail of that now, um, but certainly the civil statute, the um, parental order statute, says that you can pay reasonable expenses um, to a surrogate, which effectively means out-of-pocket expenses. But any payments that are made over and above reasonable expenses have to be authorised by the court retrospectively. Now, you will have gathered that most international surrogacy arrangements, including the US, will be um, commercial surrogacy, or as we tend to call them in the UK, compensated surrogacy arrangements. Now, they're perfectly lawful in the US, and the court recognizes that. And the court has to just go through the payments, work out exactly what's been paid, um, what's an expense, what's not an expense. And one of the good things about Circle is that they keep, you pay your surrogate through um, Circle and through the lawyers. So there is an escrow account um, showing all of the payments have been made, the dates they were paid, and what each of those payments were made for. You can easily differentiate between what's an expense and what's a payment, and you can then extract the um, payments or the compensation, put them into a relatively simple table, um, top that up, and then it will come to a figure that you ask the court to authorize. And that's where the court really focuses its efforts in most US parental order cases. Now, what I can say, is that there's not yet been a case um, involving any country, for that matter, where a um, parental order has not been made because of the level of payment that has been made. And that's because when the court is considering these factors, it has to weigh that against the um, best interests of the child. Uh, and the welfare of the child is the court's paramount consideration. So in effect, the court has a child who is here who by that point is a few months old, um, you know, normally around eight or nine months old by the time that there's a final hearing in the parental order application, who's clearly attached to their parents. Their parents have, have been perfect parents, um, meeting all of their needs. Their legal parents under UK law are the surrogate who, who, doesn't, who doesn't want to be parent them. Um, and um, the court is to say, well, you know, if I don't 
um, authorise these payments, then I'm effect, in effect going to be punishing the child. So the, as long as there's no, um, um, as, as long as there's no coercion or evidence of exploitation, um, which um, I have to say you wouldn't see um, in with American agencies, particularly professional. Um, professionally arranged agencies, and then the court's going to allow um, the parental order to proceed. Um, the next slide is, um, do I need to work with an unmarried surrogate? And this is a question that is often asked by commissioning parents or indeed by their US attorneys. In most cases, it is possible to work with a married surrogate. It may just affect the way in which you bring your child home um, from the US to the UK in terms of what passport you travel on and whether you can get a British passport or um, if you're not British but um, European, um, whether you could get an EU passport. If you're not British, then the nationality and, and availability of passports will be dealt with by, your, by the laws of your nationality, not by um, the, law, the law of your residence, which is England. Um, but you would need to work with an unmarried surrogate if you are a single commissioning parent. If you're a single commissioning parent, you're not currently going to be able to get a parental order, although there is a case that's currently challenging that before the courts. Um, or if you're not otherwise eligible for a parental order, as I touched on before, because um, you're not domiciled in the UK. It's always better um, to be safe than sorry in these kinds of cases. Um, make sure you ask the questions um, before you embark on the arrangement. The cases where things have gone wrong um, are normally where there's been no thought of the legal issues um, before arrangements are entered into. Um, each case is unique in um, in that sense. Um, so um, there are a number of factors which may impact on it. Um, it and to lawyers who are experienced in this area, it's not difficult for them to identify um, issues um, before they arise, um, and that involves working with both um, local counsel in your um, in the UK and with the um, lawyers in the US. Um, so that really concludes um, what I've got to say. Uh, I will be around uh, after Tara's finished. Um, if there's any questions for me, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Tara Carr and I am a parent through the Circles program. Um, now I can't see the slides but I will answer all of my questions. Uh, I will go through my journey to surrogacy and the uh, process of getting pregnant and the birth in the United States and coming home. Um, so my husband and I have one son through IVF and we struggled very, very, very much to get him um, for various different reasons that we don't really know all the answers to. But after I finally did have him, I I tried again to have a second and I just couldn't do it. So we embarked on surrogacy in the UK uh, using my egg and my husband's sperm. And that sadly went very, very wrong, uh, not with a surrogate, but with the embryo. Um, and it was terribly sad. Uh, and that led me to circle because I wanted an egg donor and I wanted this uh, I had no backup in the UK I had no support no one to take me through how to handle that situation nothing so I really I felt the absolute need for um, a coordinator and uh, the support behind me um, I found circle and uh, very quickly signed up with them um, we got given through them two different IVF clinics that were particularly good and we Skyped with both doctors and chose um, one in Connecticut. So my husband flew to Connecticut uh, to give his sample and we chose our egg donor um, and she was flown to Connecticut uh, to have her eggs collected and the IVF happened there all without me and uh, then our surrogate was flown to that clinic to have the embryo implanted. 
we were very lucky and we got pregnant on our second um, embryo transfer. Um, we had an amazing surrogate, absolutely incredible. Um, and we flew to America uh, when she was 20 weeks pregnant. So I had such full involvement. I was on Skype through every scan, every doctor's appointment, always on the phone, always felt part of it. And then um, after the 20-week scan, we flew to Utah with our son so that he could see his baby sister on the scan and we could meet our surrogate face to face and her family. She was a single lady with three children, so we spent some time just doing stuff with the kids and getting to know her. And it was just nice to be around the pregnancy. Um, we then, the way we'd worked it out was we were going to have her induced one week early so that we could be there for the, this was, it was very much her choice. Um, we weren't going to make her do that, but she was happy to do that. And we were going to go there two weeks before the due date to sort of set up home, get everything ready and be there for the birth. But of course, the baby came early. So what happened was it was like a movie and it was amazing. And uh, she had her final obgyne appointment and the baby was the wrong way and he wanted to turn the baby and get the baby out. So it was really quick and sudden. This was three weeks before her due date. So I literally got on a plane with my son and my mother and flew to Utah, which took me 20 hours door to door. And I had no idea during the journey if my daughter had been born or if I'd missed it. And when I got to Salt Lake City, I rang Chris and she was five centimeters dilated. And I literally got in a taxi, went to the hospital. This was about 11 o'clock at night. And um, Bo arrived 41 minutes after I entered the hospital. So I watched her come out. I cut the cord, she went straight on my skin, and then Chris held her, and it was just absolutely beautiful and amazing and incredible. Um, my husband then joined us, and we spent about three and a half weeks in Salt Lake City, which is where she lived. Um, and we did a lot of due diligence. We did, we did a DNA test just so we had all the possible paperwork. But in fact, we got the American passport. And because our surrogate was single, um, Matt was the, well, is the biological father and was the father on the pre-birth order as well. And we did have a pre-birth order that I was the mother and he was the father. So we got an American passport and we applied for the British passport, but we came home with all our paperwork from Colin and uh, DNA testings and um, just everything we needed in a folder. But we got to immigration and the man that just straight through, he said, uh, I assume you will be getting an English passport for her. And we said yes. And that was it. No questions asked. She's got a British passport now and we're about to finalize our parental order in May. Um, so that's really that's it. It's been so beautiful and and we've got our baby, which is really the most amazing thing because we've had sort of eight years of hell, really, and it's all over and we've got a complete family. Um, now, the reason we chose Circle is for all the reasons that have been stated before. As Brett said, the screening process for the surrogate is just amazing. I remember I spoke to one other surrogacy um, clinic at, at the very beginning of my research, and they said something like, yeah, sure, you can, you can just sign up tomorrow. We'll match you tomorrow. And now, knowing all the things I know, you, that's not what you want to hear at all. You want, a, you want a really vigorous process of being matched and of the surrogates being screened because it just works, and it's worked so well for us. And also, all this information you're hearing tonight, if this is the first time you're hearing it, it is so overwhelming and there's so much legal chat and it's mind-boggling. And actually, it's really important to have these people that give you the help every, you know, 
our, we have an amazing coordinator. I spoke to her all the time. I always spoke to the lawyers there. You know, it's like a big happy family, and they are on your side, and they're ready to help you. And the egg donor process there is so wonderful. Um, they've got their own egg donor agency, but we actually chose a different egg donor agency because of a specific egg donor. But again, they, they matched that up brilliantly for us and dealt with that agency fine. And So they hold your hand through the whole thing and just make it very manageable and less overwhelming than it all sounds. Um, and I think that's it from me, really, other than, you know, have, have babies because they're great. <laughs> Um, a party back. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tara and Colin. Yes, have babies, they're great most of the time. <laughs> um, so I think we're now going to just go through the questions. And so if anybody has questions, please feel free to type them in. I will read them and then we can have the appropriate person uh, talk. And, and we'll anything that's duplicate will just erase. So if you know, if you don't have your specific wording read, it's just that it's probably been answered already. So the first question was just clarifying how to read the cost sheets. Um, it's slightly unclear if the IVF costs are options or additional to the agency fees. It really depends on what you need. If you look at our cost sheets online, and I would encourage everybody to go online and read, uh, look at the cost sheet. The first page of the cost sheet goes through everything regarding the surrogate, the donor, if you need a donor, um, circles fees, legal fees in the U.S., etc. On the second page, you're going to have IVF up top, and that really depends on what you need. If you have your own embryos already, and you know, and they were created for your own use without the use of a donor, you may not need to create new embryos for twenty-five to thirty-seven thousand um, dollars. If you know, and, and you would just need the screening of the carrier and the transfer, which would probably be five to seven thousand. But there will be some sort of IVF cost that you need. Below that, you're going to have the travel expenses, which is the estimated travel for the screening um, and the transfer if you're just GS only, or the screening and the retrieval and the transfer if, you're, if you need an egg donor. And the last thing is the insurance section. So next question. <clears throat> what options are there for intended parents who would like to try for twins? Um, with People that try for twins, that's really, from the, from the circle perspective, there's no different contract except for the insurance piece that I spoke about. So if you would like to have twins, whether you're a heterosexual couple and your doctor is encouraging you to put more than one embryo in or you, know, you just want to have twins, whether you're a same-sex couple and you want to create embryos with two different fathers with the same donor, so you put one of each, each person in, that is perfectly fine. Um, the only real difference is you know, making sure that you have insurance in place to cover twins. And, you know, it's slightly more expensive if you get pregnant with twins because the carrier will ask for more and there's just a higher chance of there being some um, complications afterwards. Okay. Next question. Do intended parents have to pay separately for the legal fees regarding the re repatriation? to the UK, or is this all covered as part of the agency fees? I'll let Colin, uh, Colin answer in a second, but the circle cost sheets do not include the estimate of international um, lawyers because it varies from every country. In some countries, you establish your legal rights in the United States and you return home. In countries like, the U like in the UK, you would have to do some legal work there. So our cost sheets do not include the estimate for UK services. And Colin, maybe you can speak a little bit about the costs. Yeah. Um, so our costs, um, we have sort of a sliding scale of costs, really. Um, for full representation, we can offer um, capped, um, capped estimates where we charge our hourly rate up to a certain amount. Uh, and we will give you, sorry, there's a bit of an echo on the phone. Um, we will give you that estimate. Um, after we've spoken to you on an obligation basis, working out how much we, time we think we're going to be spending on the case, and that will be a top-end estimate. So it's not a fixed fee, because if we do less than that, you won't pay that, but if we do more than that, you won't pay over what we already estimate. Our fees are separate from the immigration fees. Um, some people feel that they need to take immigration advice. 
uh, and specialist immigration advice. Um, those are um, separate to the lawyers, so we, separate from the lawyers that we work with um, at Wesley Grick. Um, if the full, we, we also offer lower fees for um, advising and assisting in the background where we're not on the court record and intended parents are representing themselves through the process and we check the paperwork and we um, prepare documents for them before hearings and things like that to address the law. But they will do um, a lot of the work to keep the costs down. But we can talk about that on a one-to-one -one basis. Okay, thank you. And and, and if you, in, in a consultation, if you have any questions about uh, the UK process, we could connect you directly to Colin. Um, the next question, is the unlimited IVF available for the GSED program? Yes, it is. It depends on the IVF clinic that you use. Um, one of the main clinics that we work with in, in California, they offer an unlimited plan only to circle clients um, because a lot of it depends on the quality of the surrogates, the quality of the egg donors that you're choosing. And IVF clinics often will not want to do an unlimited IVF plan if, if you're working with unproven people. And so, you know, we have a few clinics that have a lot of faith in us and history with us, so they offer unlimited. But yes, it's certainly available if you're using a donor. Um, yeah, and it depends on the clinic that you're working with. Uh, next, question for Tara. What time frames were involved for you, Tara? Um, any further advice you can give as this is uh, very daunting? Um, yes, the time frame for us was 18 months from start to finish. So from the moment we signed up uh, to being matched with a surrogate, to doing the IVF, getting pregnant and having a baby. So it, it, it does sound very daunting now, it really does. And you just have to take one thing at a time and know the most important thing, the, the most important emotional thing that's been said in this whole webinar is when Brett said you will be guaranteed a baby because you're going to be working with fantastic surrogates and fantastic egg donors and fantastic IVF clinics, so it should never be too much longer than 18 months. But obviously, look, before that, you know, anything can go wrong, but you, you're, not, you're hopefully not ever looking at that much longer if you're using the right stuff. Okay, thank you. So uh, one more question. If anybody else has any other questions, please type them in. Um, Colin, I think again for you, what are the capped fees for the international repatriation to the UK? I don't know if you can give any more specifics. Um, well, in terms of the repatriation, in terms of bringing a baby home, that would be, they, they wouldn't be our fees. Um, so I couldn't really comment on those. Um, at the moment, I would say our average fees for the full estimate for the parental order liaising with US Council is um, somewhere between um, nine and ten thousand pounds plus VAT. Um, we do, we try to minimise outside costs, um, so we don't normally instruct barristers unless there are complex issues that arise. Um, we do most of the court representation in house, um, usually by by me. Um, but um, so that's we can give a more detailed estimate when we speak to you individually because there may be more complicated features which may affect that or it may be less, um, but that's probably our average. Okay. And, and I would also say that we've had, when the parental order became available, there were solicitors that were asking for in, insane amounts, especially for captain, and, and there were people that were charging 25 to 50,000 pounds. And you know we've always found that, that Colin and Anne-Marie were, were very good Council and you know very reasonable in terms of price and compared to the other attorneys that we've worked with from the UK I mean we've had excellent results with them and that they're far more reasonable than some of the other council that we've worked with Okay, so it looks like that's all of the questions um, We will be sending an email to everybody so that you have a copy of this if you have any if, if you would like it um, if you have any questions please feel free to follow up and ask us questions and we would love to schedule a consultation whether in person or you know if, if you want to come the next time that we're um, in the UK and London in May. So thank you all for your time today for coming and thank you Colin, Brett and Tara.
Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brett. Thank, thank you. you, guys.